Welcome guys to an episode with the Doom Hell. Today is going to be an impactful episode where we talk about a kind of a weird idea that I had. So basically, quite a while ago, uh, there was this cool console called the Ouya that came out. And it was cool because it kind of tried to revitalize what was great about indie games. You, you had a pocket, pocket-sized pocket console that would run any kind of indie game it wanted. And it had, came with a controller. It was very, very cheap. I think they were a, a $50.00. Uh, MSRP and you know it was just kind of like an Android box like an early Android box and it kind of did the job but it was undercooked and uh, it ended up failing quite badly but uh, we live in different times now and I believe to revive a lot of technologies such as Blu-ray uh, Thunderbolt like mainstream Thunderbolt uh, to revive um, MGPU to revive dual socket uh, uh, gaming and uh, Steam OS. I believe that we need to build a magnificent console, an absolute magnet of power. And this would, this uh, theoretical or fantasy idea would probably coincide with the new uh, Meteor Lake uh, core architecture, which would likely make it cheaper to build chiplet design uh, CPUs. Which means that theoretically, you know, you could hire Intel as a SOC firm and they would, you know, custom make a chip and that would probably yield some pretty good performance for us. So thanks to these really tiny tiles of uh, lithography that they're using now, uh, we're hoping that we're, we would be able to get onto some Atom cores, some, you know, uh, E-core setup. And I believe that this would be very beneficial as a Wii sized uh gaming PC so on the front there would be a blu-ray disc and you know power reset and you'd have a couple of USBs um, potentially USB C's and uh, just like the Wii on the back you would get two display ports then you would get two full-fledged USB uh, 3.2 type 2 x2 so you get 40 gigabits per second like uh, topped out but the real benefit would be that uh, you, you would plug in a sort of like card that has peripheral on, on it and uh, that card would be like your main peripheral card so you could have like multiple usbs you could run them in uh, you could have cards with like a gigabit uh, ethernet setup for lan you could have all kinds of cool cards that would not come in out of the box but you know at, at worst you still have just two usbs then you would have uh, here a 10 gigabit LAN or, you know, you know 2.5 would just be fine, but a 10 gigabit would be pretty sick. And then a power right here. So here you might get two Thunderbolts and two uh, th uh, 3.0 type C's. And then on the back, you would get two 3.2 type 2X2's and two mini display ports connected directly to your GPU. So what would be the internals of this computer? And by the way, I believe the computer would be slightly bigger than usual. So the internals would be uh, kind of interesting. So for the first part is the power. The power would be two Pico ITX uh, power supply boards running 90 watts. We might be able to get around 240 watts if we really push it. They'd be tiny slim boards and they'd be really close to the power connector so that we have the most space possible on the rest of the board. Then we would get a custom, customized Pico IT export. This would be a dual uh, Meteor Lake Celeron uh, CPUs, hopefully eight cores per uh, CPU, running 16 cores at 3.75 gigahertz max. So we would still try to use the Intel boost uh, clocks and, and so on and so forth. Now to run that, uh, we might need either a PLX chip or we could potentially try to run PCI gen 5 uh, in relay which would allow them to communicate within each other very very fast i don't know which one's faster and which one's more easy to do with like linux drivers or or windows drivers so that would be left to the developers or or you know whoever wants to think about it they would run 4x dims uh which means that you're technically running quad channel and you could run uh, ddr5x on on those uh quad channels which would give you 7500 megahertz at like CL32. So that's very beneficial. Uh, because you're running two Celerons, that means that you can run 4x PCI uh, Gen 5 slash 4, 
uh, theoretic. Well, what would we probably need is two uh, full-fledged X16s, and then we would just run the rest on uh, M.2s for M.2s purposes. So, <clears throat> with the M.2s, one of them would run uh, ray tracing uh, or AI uh, GPU, and then the other one would run a Gen 5 SSD. <clears throat> and of course, running Gen 4 would allow you better latency, and Gen 5 would allow you a lot more bandwidth. So, whichever one is better is uh, what would be ran for each of the applications. So, for the other two PCIe, what we do is we run them at, in Gen 4 speeds, and that will be for the GPUs. So, the GPUs, I believe that we could potentially run two A750 cores with 8 gigabytes of VRAM, but in DDR6X uh, bandwidth. And <clears throat> we would do this by re-relaying the DDR6 that is on the regular on the regular boards uh, into a way that the chiplets uh, double in, in the uh, lines. So, but we would be running these cores at 75 watts, which means they would be, you know, approximately a 380 performance. So the real benefit of running them like this would that in, G in MGPU mode, we can run some of the cache so that we can actually uh, get some of the bandwidth back uh, when running in MGPU. So that would allow them to run in 2x mode without actually losing that much performance. And <clears throat> another thing is that we could te technically run them with 10 gigabytes or 12 gigabytes of VRAM and then allocate some of that VRAM to, uh, you know, allow them to run together or, or talk together, have some crosstalk happening with also the RT cores. That's the other thing that has to be uh, pretty important. So in summation, what kind of performance will we pretty, pretty much get is we'd have a 16 core uh, CPU setup, which would be around 3950x performance from like the numbers that I that I kind of checked out. Um, on paper, we have quad channels. We would have uh, upwards of 48 gigabytes of VRAM in DDR5, which means 75 megahertz CL32. That's very impressive. We would have one uh, Gen 5 SSD, which means we could go up to four terabytes, eight terabytes even at you know quite high speeds, uh, 12 gigabytes per second or faster. Um, we would have one ray tracing NVMe GPU, which would allow us to run some pretty interesting uh, AI and DLS, or not DLSs, but uh, ray tracing applications and kind of help us with some of the gaming and ray tracing. And then we would have dual uh, A750 or actually A380 performance running 16 gigabytes of VRAM. And then with the resizable bar, uh, we could theoretically in Vulkan like run quite a bit more VRAM if we wanted to kind of allocate our RAM and our SSDs speeds to allow for the, for kind of that that uh you know the, the potential latency bottlenecks that would happen in MGPU. Uh, now, uh, obviously, running 90 180 watts would probably be kind of the limiting factor. Another factor would be the the TDP. You know, running two X uh, Celerons, even a single Celeron eight core would probably run kind of hot. So there would be a lot of piping, a lot of uh, vapor chambers happening inside the uh, the little console. But really, the cool part would be how compact and how efficient uh, this gaming machine would run. Now, on the marketing side, how would we sell this to, to gamers? Well, for one, it would have a read and a write, uh, a read and a write Blu-ray disc, and we would sell it with uh, forty. Uh, Blu-rays, BDXLs actually, so the big boys, the 128 gigs, which would allow gamers to basically like save whatever they want. Uh, we would also have a, a secondary possibility, so you could either have this, or you could have a uh, Thunderbolt to SATA connector, which would allow you to basically run external hard drives if you if you truly want to. Then we would also have three X games onto the console. We would basically hire uh, a couple of developers that are running web, web 3.0 systems. And the reason why we want to do that is that we want people to run in our platform and not other platforms. So for one, these games would come on disks. The disks would be encrypted in AES and uh, they would only allow, you would only allow to be uh, playing online if you have the disk inside and that would run 
uh, you would basically have to be in, uh, um, what do you call that, in always online systems because these would be MMO type games. Now the games would be chosen very specifically. They would firstly have to be Web 3.0 compliant, which means that uh, you know they have a crypto wallet attached to them. So each game would have crypto accounts and those crypto accounts would have a crypto wallet, which would allow us to run on the console an entire crypto marketplace which would really be our selling point in the way that we would make as much profit as possible. The actual console, like the performance of the console and all these kinds of things, that's what's weighing down. But the actual crypto uh, cryptocurrency marketplace would be the thing that weighs it back up. The second thing is that in the background, these games need to be able to mine using the console. So running two GPUs, if one of the GPUs isn't running the game, the GPU can run uh, in uh, low low power mining, and that would be very very efficient. And that's also why we would be able to get a a very fast like a 10 gig LAN port on the on the console. Now, of course, that means that both GPUs have to be very well maintained in a way that you know even if it's like very dusty or whatever it may be, that these console could be able to still run at their max uh, uh, TDP, no problem. Uh, and if that is not the case, if we can't do that, then there must be a way to s flip the driver so that there's a Bitcoin mining driver and a non-Bitcoin mining driver. So in the background, it has to do that. It has to be Web 3.0 compliant. And then the final thing is, is that these games have to be fairly simple, but they also have to be quite complex in, in their kind of atmosphere. So they do have to be kind of MMO-like in the sense that you can have multiple adventures, but each adventure is pretty simple. And that's really because you want to have uh, the max hours, okay? Because if these games are, are good and people like to play them constantly, then we were, will be able to mine with the console. And again, if we run a certain threshold and you know, if you make like a billion dollars on the first, uh, on the first consoles, then you can pay off most of the loan that you've taken for the consoles to be built. So that would be the three games on the console. On top of that, uh, the BDXL. So, uh, giving them Blu-ray discs. Why? Why do that? Well, because we would give them an environment. So this is the first aspect. So one, this is two. We would give them an environment for them to buy games. So whether it's uh, Steam OS, whether it's uh, Epic Games, whether it's our own. Uh, environment it doesn't really matter but the environment would allow them to write up games onto their uh, new blu-ray discs so these blu-ray discs buying them in 10,000 20,000 30,000 it's very cheap per disc and then when we sell the discs uh, we are kind of guaranteed that these people are going to write on the discs uh, and we're talking about like four terabytes worth of games so for each for even just one uh, game to be written on one blu-ray disc we can make a lot of money so this is another way that that the game would be mar the, the console would be marketed and lastly it would be sponsorships so the console on the console uh, in the menu you would have uh, advertisement then on the console itself you would have stickers for different companies so for instance uh, we would be able to uh, get some money from the Intel uh, uh, development departments uh, we'd be able to get potentially like uh, gen 5 SSD uh, sponsorships. We'd be able to get uh, sponsorships for the NVMe AI uh, GPUs and so on and so forth. So really, it's a threefold marketing solution and it's a plethora of gaming uh, possibilities. Now, why would the game... Now, here's another thing. We're running dual CPU and we're running MGPU. Why would the games support this? Well, for one, the games already have the tools for this to work with with uh, Vulkan. But for two, the reason is very simple because we would promise a huge buying, uh, a, a huge buying, what do you call that? A buying market. We would sell consoles at a fairly cheap price, say 650 USD, maybe even more depending on what specs you put in. And these people would all come with the three games that uh, we decide to go with. So those three games are already going to, to try to 
optimized for and GPU and all these things. But then once those games have written up uh, better tools or optimizations or documentation for MGPU and dual CPU of the modern era, well, that's when more people will be able to write up uh, games much more efficiently that would run these things. So, in fact, this would be a plug-and-play solution. And then finally, how, how do we make it so that people don't hack out of our environment? Well, uh, there would be no incentive to do so. We would make our environment better than if they just you know, put in Windows. So we would have custom libraries written onto our quote unquote Steam OS. We would have uh, ways to better optimize the MGPU and uh, dual CPU solution. And finally, we would also have a crypto account attached to their console, uh, whereby they make they actually make cash back by using their uh, their console to be mined. So it would not be like uh, they would have very little incentive to actually put on Windows or whatever it may be, because then it would actually cripple their performance. So that's kind of what what I thought about, uh, you know, in the back of my mind uh, in the shower. And I hope you guys enjoyed and have a good day.